Thank you for being here today. For <laughs> um, We always thought the Senate as a lower chamber, and I tried to achieve Whoa. that with the chair here. It, did, it worked. <laughs> We're the upper chamber today. <laughs> The House of Representatives rocks, by the way. Anyway, oh, wow. <laughs> um, our Vice Chair will do our invocation, uh, Vice Chair Bobby Reese. Um, what's your number there, Bobby? Cause, and you can sit and pull the mic to you, and that, and it'll, okay. Okay, that'd be fine. Turn off my phone. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we just come to you humbly this morning, Lord, uh, asking for wisdom, Lord, as we make decisions about your uh, creation and uh, just uh, the beautiful things you've given us and blessed us with. Lord, we do pray for your wisdom and guidance. Uh, Father, we pray for peace. And Lord, just uh, guide us, Lord, in a way that would be pleasing in your sight. In your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, thank everyone for coming. Chairman Tolson of the um, upper chamber on the Senate side of the General Assembly will um, make his welcoming comments and introduce his staff. Uh, thank you. It's good to see everybody today. Um, uh, appreciate everybody coming back. And this is a series of, of joint hearings that we're going to hold uh, as we go along. And it's intended to educate the members of our committees on uh, – because we have to um, – create policy going forward, and we feel like continuing ed needs to go along with that. So uh, we appreciate everyone coming. I want to uh, thank the commissioners for being here this morning, Holcomb and Director, uh, Carol Couch for being here, and uh, I want to introduce also Miss Vicki Gibbs. It's uh, my right hand in my office and my left hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, we have Miss Lauren Newsom, who is my committee aide uh, this year. And I uh, just want you all to get to know them in case you need to come in and call on them also. Um, but we do appreciate everyone coming and look forward to a lot of good continuing ed as we go forward. I think it's going to help us form real good policy for the state of Georgia. Uh, so we look forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Then I need to do a few housekeeping announcements for everyone. This is a joint House and Senate Natural Resources meeting. So for our committee members who are present, you have to hit the button that has your number on it, and that way we'll know to turn your mic on when it's time for you to ask your question. Pull the mic forward and speak directly into the mic. If you don't, then the um, webcast, they only hear the answer. They don't hear your question. So you need to speak directly into your mic. Also, introduce yourself as that's going on. Today's topic is going to be promulgation of agency rules and regs, and it's and in a little bit um, Noah Holcomb, who is um, head of the Department of Natural Resources, will make that introduction, and Director Couch is also here in case you have any questions of her. But um, before we hear this presentation, I, I would like just to point out a, a few of the members that um, serve, one member serves, but one uh, employee of the state of Georgia serves both committees. And then our other um, members on the House side I'd like to introduce to you as well, our, our support staff. Wayne Allen, and Wayne, if you'll just stand and uh, so we, everyone can see who you are. Wayne Allen is our legislative counsel. He is assigned to both the House and the Senate. And he's the person that we go to as legislators with our ideas for legislation. And he will craft it into the bill form for us. But just to make sure the House Committee understands as we promulgated some rules and regs the last time we had our meeting that dealt with some changes because we're now broadcasting. And so I want everyone to understand that, that all legislative members have access to legislative counsel at all times. When we are in a, a public meeting such as this, a full committee meeting, and you have your private conversation with legislative counsel, just keep in mind that to quietly move over there and do that as opposed to um, just, just time your uh, graceful exit from your chair to go over there and talk to them it's in case especially somebody else is talking at the time but then also I want to point out that um, when a, a question is directed for a public answer from legislative council then that question needs to go through the chair this is no change in policy it's what we've always done but I felt it important to, to make sure everybody understood that and um, I'm not sure how many years Wayne has served as a uh, legislative council but I feel so fortunate as Chair of Natural Resources to have such a talented person to, to help us with our issues. Then I would also like to introduce 
Pat Alexander. She is the new administrative assistant to the House Natural Resources Committee. Pat has 29 years of service in state government. She comes to us highly qualified. Pat, will you just stand for a minute so people can see you? Welcome. And then Gardner Sapp, sitting next to me, is a committee aide to the House Natural Resources and Environment. He's also the committee aide to Agriculture and Consumer Affairs, Game, Fish, and Parks Committee. So uh, there are about three or four gardeners running around. And then also we have Erica Askew. Erica, if you'll stay. All right. You can, is there room for you up here in this area? You're just catching people that come in. So Erica's in the back of the room, and Erica is the committee intern. She is working with Gardner and all the committees previously mentioned. Erica comes to us from Georgia College and State University, where she is pursuing a degree in political science. And in her spare time, so she's on the right committee, she likes to hunt, fish, and then the final thing is watch NASCAR. Well, I was afraid she's going to say she wants to drive NASCAR, so that might be in your future, right? <laughs> and then um, right now I'd like to turn the program over to um, Noah Holcomb, who's uh, head of the Department of Natural Resources. Okay. And uh, Chairman Tolson has one thing to say. I want to apologize. I have Miss Angie Thies from Center, Center Research back here. Angie, would you stand up? She she is our right hand information getter and does a great job and knows a lot about water law in Georgia and a lot of different issues that we work on. And, and Angie's always there. And Angie, I apologize for I thought we introduced last time. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. All right, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and uh, Chairman Tollison. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, thank each of you as uh, members of these committees that are willing to serve uh, and uh, be partner with us and steward as stewards of the natural resources of this state. Um, I want to talk to you just a few minutes about uh, the rulemaking process, and then I'm going to introduce uh, David Word with the uh, Environmental Protection Division, and he's going to actually walk you through a case study of how a the Board of Natural Resources goes through the rulemaking process. But first, I just had a couple of comments, that, and I think for most of you this is going to be old news, but uh, I think I can shed a little bit of light on the openness that the Department of Natural Resources uh, and the transparency, uh, the process that we use to, to set and make rules that affect the citizens of this state. You know, as members of the General Assembly, it's important for you to understand the processes uh, that take place after the legislation is passed when, when you go home after the 40th day. Obviously, the Department of Natural Resources uh, follows the Administrative Procedures Act that governs not only us but all state agencies. And this sets out pretty clear direction on how we do rulemaking in, in, our, um, in our agency. Uh, we strive to reach out beyond this, however. Uh, we have a number of practices uh, utilizing all the technology available uh, to us to include and be it as inclusive as we possibly can and as transparent as we possibly can when uh, promulgating rules that affect the citizens of the state. Uh, you know, the majority of the rules, as you might imagine, that, uh, that we promulgate actually uh, focus on environmental protection division. Many of the contentious ones that you're familiar with certainly have focused on environmental protection. But I want to remind you that uh, we have most of our agencies are affected by this, particularly uh, setting hunting and fishing regulations uh, through the Wildlife Resources Division. And just yesterday, our Board of Natural Resources promulgated new rules affecting whether we can have pets in our cottages on state parks. Uh, you know, is that as uh, the uh, people that come to our state parks as well as many other facilities begin to get older and older than, and they're having small pets with them. It became a hindrance to them to travel and utilize our facilities without some accommodations in this area. And it may seem trivial, but we do want to reach out to all of our citizens and, and make our uh, facilities available when we can and be the stewards that we uh, are uh, chartered to be. And finally, uh, another one that we're undergoing the process right now, and uh, I mentioned to a few of you a few moments ago, we uh, just set the price on the deadhead log legislation that, uh, that y'all passed last year, and we're in the process of refining that, pro that uh, program as we move forward. Uh, we're firmly committed to public involvement. Uh, most of you know uh, 
my predecessor, Linus Barrett, started a public involvement task force back in 2001 that looked at uh, all aspects of public involvement with DNR. And just to mention a few of those areas, we looked at rulemaking, public meetings, hearings, development of new policies, and access to documents. And this task force made a number of recommendations that uh, were presented to the board back in 2003. Just yesterday, after the 2003 uh, uh, presentation, the board asked us to come back in uh, 18 months to 24 months and tell them how we're doing on uh, adopting those recommendations. And just yesterday, we made that, uh, that presentation to the board. They found overwhelmingly that we were on target to, to meet those recommendations in all but a couple of areas, and they had some minor suggestions of things that, uh, that we could do to better that process, which the board uh, recommended by resolution yesterday that we proceed with doing. Uh, we also use a lot of task forces, advisory committees. We uh, have extensively used the Carl Benson Institute and in, uh, government in uh, Athens to assist, assist us with facilitating meetings of stakeholders. Uh, I just want to reiterate, it's, uh, reiterate that it's important for you to remember that we're committed to public involvement, uh, our, but our professional staff still has to weigh the biology uh, the technology of the issues that come before us and uh, take that input to determine the best course of action uh, when we are uh, making decisions that affect the natural resources and the citizens of the state. It's not an easy task, particularly when you have uh, input from competing interests. Uh, this information is presented to the Board of Natural Resources, which uh, makes the final policy, sets the final rules, regardless of staff input. I think uh, without going any further, I, it's in order for me to uh, uh, now pass on the torch to uh, David Word and let him go through an actual rulemaking process. I don't remember the one that uh, you're actually going to use, but uh, it's, a, it's a real world uh, uh, process and uh, you'll understand the process we use to getting to that point. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Commissioner Holcomb. And David Ward is the Assistant Director of, of the Environmental Protection Division. And we as a committee understand that he is retiring. And I asked David what he's going to do next. And he said, well, he thought he'd get a job teaching French. He said, because he wants a pay increase. <laughs> <laughs> I read it in the newspaper every day. More money to education, salary, <laughs> and And then I said, but you don't know French. He said, well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> he just not anything about teaching either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm making this comment because before you begin your presentation, so many of the committee members have expressed to me how much they appreciate your availability to them through the years. And... Um, as, as legislators, we get calls all the time for our constituents, and what we become are liaisons to one of our agencies, and we have a contact person that we can call, and David has fallen into that role for us on several occasions. So Chairman Tollison and I got together, and we each are going to have a respective resolution in our chambers today, and we ask our committee members to please sign it in, in each chamber because we want to recognize you. And if we dropped it earlier, you would have found that out. So anyway, here's the resolution, and this is from both of our chambers. We're commending David M. Word and for other purposes. Whereas David M. Word has served the state with distinction in various cap capacities for the Environmental Protection Division of the Department of Natural Resources and whereas he earned a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, see I knew you didn't teach French, from Duke University in 1972, earned a Master's of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from the University of Maryland in 1973, and is a registered professional engineer in the state, and whereas beginning his employment with the EPD in 1974 as an engineer in the Municipal Wastewater Program, his outstanding performance and dedication led him to rise steadily through the ranks to become manager of the Water Quality Program manager of the Industrial Wastewater Program, chief of the Water Resources Branch, and chief of the Water Protection Branch, and whereas he was honored with the Governor's Award in 1982, and whereas he was appointed Assistant Director of EPD in 1992, and whereas he has been married for 30 years and has an 18-year-old son and a 9-year-old daughter, and whereas in addition to his professional achievements and his dedication to his family, he is also an outstanding amateur athlete, having run eight marathons. You'll have more time now. <laughs> now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives, and then the Senate resolution will say by the uh, 
Senate chambers, that the member of this body commend David M. Ward for his many achievements and contributions to the welfare of the state. Please join me in recognizing this. I'm glad you did that first because I was going to tell you I come this morning as a failure. Um, I've been working the past couple days trying to figure out how to make the topic of uh, public – go ahead. Nobody can hear you. We just found out the mic is not plugged in. So if Good, we so can I hear can... you here, but from webcast, this gentleman behind you is going to do that. See what you're going to miss with government? <laughs> Provocative, stimulating, interesting. I couldn't figure it out. So uh, <laughs> this morning, don't, don't expect to leave here being stimulated. Hopefully, at least, uh, let's try to leave informed. Let's, let's, let's shoot for informed. But while he's working on that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And you have in your folders um, a brief description of, um, the, of the rulemaking process. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll walk through it in general with you, and then I'll, I'll go through one specific rule. Thank you. Um, let's uh, start at the beginning, or if you want to, we can begin at the start, either one. The rulemaking starts with an idea. It starts with a thought. For the Environmental Protection Division, many of our rules um, are identical to rules by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. So when EPA changes their rule, that triggers us. That's the start of us doing a rule. We also do rule changes when there are new laws or amendments to the laws. You all are extremely familiar with that, both at the state and federal level. Also, a start of a rule can be someone internal to EPD that's working with the rule for a long time, has an idea to make the rule better. This rule needs this correction or it's out of date or I have a better way to do it. And then some of our rule ideas come from folks outside EPD. Um, people, maybe a city or an industry or environmental group, have some ideas on how our rules can be changed and improved. That's a way to start the rule. Um, and that can be done informally or it can be done formally. The Administrative Procedures Act has a, a provision that a citizen can petition a state board, like the Board of Natural Resources, to change a rule. But usually it, those kind of things are done informally. So once the idea is started, then we have early development of the rule. You know, what is the language? What is the rule change? Sometimes that's very easy. If it's a, a change just to represent a change in an EPA rule, like the drinking water standard for arsenic changes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.10, well, that phase is pretty quick. It takes about five seconds to change. But many times a rule change is new ideas, uh, involves a lot of creative thinking. We're plowing new ground in this rule. That early development phase is very, very important. And the first language development might be done with a group of stakeholders. It might be done with a lot of folks outside EPD as well as inside EPD, depending upon the rule. At the same time that language is being prepared, we're also thinking, what is the public participation process that we want to follow once we get that early language developed? and we actually formulate a public participation plan that we follow through the rest of the rulemaking process tailored specifically for that rule. Again, if it's just a Xerox of a federal rule, the public participation can be pretty rudimentary. If it's a controversial rule, if it has a large impact on natural resources, there will be a lot of different thoughts. The public participation ban plan would be much more involved and much more uh, long process. After we get that together, we brief the Board of Natural Resources on the language, why we're doing this, what we're doing, what the public participation plan will be, just in a briefing session at one of their meetings. That way the board members know what's going on. Um, they can start thinking about the rules, so when we come back to them later on in the process, they have already been educated on it. Also, in that early briefing, if there are any key areas that the board wants us to focus on or they have any real concerns or real um, interests in the specific aspects of the rule, they can identify that and we can focus on that. After the, the board's been briefed, 
we sometimes, for, especially for a new rule, go out to public notice, not in a formal way, not following the Administrative Procedures Act, but just to get the rule out there on the street informally to see how close we are. We've done some preparation work. We don't think we're there yet. We need some help. We go out to public notice. We might hold some meetings. We might hold some workshops just to get some early input from the public on the rule. Again, if it's a very simple rule, we might skip that step. We go through that process. We've gotten some ideas. We might make some changes to that language. We feel pretty confident about the rule. Then we start the formal public notice process. This is where the Administrative Procedures Act and the requirements for all boards of state kick in. Up till now in the process, everything we're doing is outside the minimal requirements of the law. They're things that, that EPD and DNR do to get ready. The formal public notice and comment period um, is very, very important. We issue an exact copy of the proposed rule, and that's, that's key. It's not maybe we're going to do this, maybe we're going to do this. Here, citizens of the state of Georgia, this is exactly the rule change we're proposing. Um, the public notice tells when we're going to hold a public hearing, and always the uh, DNR agencies always hold public hearings on proposed rules. It's not a requirement, but it's something that DNR always does. We tell the public in this notice how, how they can receive their comments. They can write them in. We set up an email account for them. We hold the public hearing. The Board of Natural Resources allows for comments at their meetings. We give a synopsis of the rule. You know, what does it mean? What, what's the brief stuff? And we give a statement of rationale. A couple of years ago, the House and the Senate was thinking that it's good government, that, sta that state agencies should be able to tell their citizens, why are you doing this rule? What information did you use in developing this rule? What other options did you consider in this rule? How much is this rule going to cost you to implement? How much is it going to cost the regulated community? That's a statement of rationale, and that is put out uh, in our public notice. A uh, footnote here. Um, uh, that was a very good law that was passed, but it only applies to EPD. I know you did that because we're the most important state agency and people care about us most. But in the future, I think it would be nice if education and defects and health people inform their citizens of something like that too. Anyway, um, we also do an analysis of the impacts on small business. And in the notice, we provide uh, uh, the date and time where the DNR board is going to consider this rule. We go through the public comment period, again, taking all the information, holding the hearings, putting it all together. And after we do that, we summarize all the comments we received. We sit down with those and we say, okay, did we get it right? Given all the comments, are we ready to take this rule to the board or do we need to make some changes? If we need to make some changes to the rule, we just can't make a few changes and then take it to the Board of Natural Resources. We go back to the formal public notice process again and put out an exact copy of the rule the way we've changed it and go through the whole process again. In the rulemaking procedures, there's no such thing as committee substitutes, no such thing as committee amendments, no such thing as floor amendments. It is very, very clear that when EPD or the board makes a decision on a rule, they're not changing it at the last minute. That's for the protection of the public, and, it, and it's a very good process. Once we've gone through the formal public notice process, we're comfortable with the rule, then we take it to the Board of Natural Resources. First, we present it to the Environmental Protection Committee of the board and give them all the information, give them a summary of the comments, our response to the comments, our recommendation, Dr. Couch, the EPD director, would make a formal recommendation on the rule. The board would consider it. The environmental committee would take any testimony at the time from the public at their meeting. And they, just like you, would decide whether to recommend pass the bill on to the full board the next day. The full board considers it. And again, they can either adopt it yes or no. If the board likes the rule, they pass it. If they don't, they can't change it and pass it. They have to tell EPD what changes they want, then we go back to the public notice process and work it through again. No surprises in, in, in this procedures. Once the rule is adopted, we file it with the Secretary of State and we have a rule. I think it's real important in this process that the public can see where we are. 
So we have developed on our website a page of proposed rules. You look at that site, it'll list out all the proposed rules we have ongoing right now, the date we went to public notice, the date of the end of the hearing uh, period, the date the board is going to consider it. You can click on that, that rule and you can go straight to the rule and see it. Also, for rules that have recently been adopted, we put the action of the board, if they accepted it or not. We put our summary of our comments, and we put all our responses to our comments on our website there so you can see where we are. So it's a, it's a pretty simple process. As an example, I want to walk you through very quickly how we develop the rules for outside water use. I don't want to get into the content of the rules because we're talking about the process today. But the rules for outside water use are the rules that say, basically, if you have an even address, you water Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, an odd address, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, and a little more detailed than that. But this rule was started by external identification. Uh, in 2002, we were gladly coming out of a drought, but we suffered some severe drought years. And citizen groups and other state agencies came to DNR and told us, you have a lot of multiple actions to deal with the drought, but you don't have a consolidated together drought management plan, and you need one. And that was a very good suggestion. The Department of Natural Resources put together a stakeholders group. Well over 100 people participated in that and finished a drought uh, plan in 2003. One of the chapters of that plan is the outdoor water use schedules, and it was recommended in that plan that those schedules be made a rule. So in January of 2003, EPD took the, that chapter, which was narrative language, and put it into rule form, developed the early rule language. And we developed a public participation plan for that rule. We briefed our board in January. They said it sounded like a good idea to them. And we issued uh, an informal public notice in February of 2004. We held a hearing in March and we got comments. A couple of the comments uh, that we felt were very, very, very worthy was from golf courses. Golf courses said that we can't treat a golf course, their water use equal, that the water use on a fairway is different than the water use on a green and on a tee, and we ought to adjust our schedules and our drought considerations versus that kind of watering. We received some comments from local governments saying, yeah, having Friday as a, as a non-watering day is a good idea, but their local government, Monday is their heavy water use day. Could they adjust their schedules like that? And we thought there were some good suggestions, so we rewrote our draft rule and went out to formal public notice with, with the rule. Um, that formal public notice um, was issued, let's see, on April 23, 2004. Also, when we issue a public notice, we always send a copy um, to Sue Brumbry, Legislative Council. We send him three copies. He provides one to the chair of the House, one to the chair of the Senate, and keeps one for his file. And we did that with this rule, this rule as well. We held a public hearing on this rule on May 17th. The comments were pretty much positive, a lot of support. So we took it to our board on May 25th and 26th. They adopted it. We filed it with the Secretary of State on June 8th. Uh, we notified all the water users on June 4th and asked them to have these water use schedules in place by August 1st. So this process probably from start to finish, when we started the rule January through May, took about five months. And that's pretty typical of how long a rule process takes. Um, the rules can be done as quick as maybe three months if it's a very simple rule, just a Xerox of a federal rule. Or they could take as long as a year, maybe up to a year and a half for, for very complicated new rules with a lot of natural resource interests, a lot of uh, diverse opinions on it. And that is the rulemaking process. Hopefully you found it uh, pretty straightforward, pretty basic, pretty logical. To me, it works. To me, the process works that it gives us a, a path to follow. It gives public input, allows our board plenty of opportunity to make the decision, and it provides them with the information they need to do their jobs to, to uh, adopt these rules. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And I do have a couple of lights that are on. I have number 13 was the first one I saw.
No question, that was a mistake. Then I have um, Representative, uh, I think it's number 19, I believe that's Representative Manny. Yes. <clears throat> David, congratulations on your retirement, but as well, we will miss you. Thank as you. As you well know, you've been a good friend for a number of years, and I appreciate your, your willingness to help us. And I'd like one last thing before you go out the door. <laughs> Um, help me understand what is the role of us as legislators when we're promulgating these rules because we we have uh, the the lawmaking effort uh, and the policy making effort and and sometimes I think it's unclear as to what exactly we should be doing okay da David would would you defer to Wayne Allen? Because then he could explain to uh, to us the the legislative. Just stand right there, and, and Wayne will come up there. Yeah. Thank you. After Wayne answers, I'll correct him for you, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Generally, executive branch agencies are subject to the Administrative Procedures Act, for example, the Department of Natural Resources. There are a few exceptions, such as the Board of Pardons and Paroles, but by and large, executive branch agencies must comply with the APA. It has been stated before the adoption of a rule, the agency must give 30-day notice. That notice goes to the lay counsel. It also goes to the presiding officer of the, each chamber. Notice is transmitted to the chair of the presiding chair of the standing committee, which would have jurisdiction over that agency. During that 30-day window of time, if that standing committee meets and adopts an objection to the rule, and the agency goes ahead and adopts the rule over that objection, then at the next regular session of the General Assembly, a resolution can be introduced in the chamber in which that committee lies during the first 30 days of that session to override the rule. If that chamber adopts the, adopts the resolution to override, it must be transmitted within five, must be transmitted immediately to the other chamber. That other chamber must consider that resolution within five days. If that chamber adopts a resolution, then you look at the major, you look at the vote in each house to adopt the resolution. If a two-thirds majority adopts the resolution to override, the rule is void immediately. If a majority adopts the resolution to override and it's less than two-thirds, then it goes to the governor. If the governor approves the resolution to override, the rule is void then. If he vetoes the resolution, then the rule remains. There is, however, an exception to this override process, and that exception is EPD. EPD was required to comply with the notice uh, provisions, the 30-day notice provisions, and again, if the standing committee, which has jurisdiction over the agency, which in this case would be Natural Resources in the House and Senate, meets and adopts an objection within that 30-day window, then EPD must consult with the committee that filed the objection within that window before adopting the rule. However, there is no provision for override of an EPD rule. There is oversight, there is consultation if the committee files an objection, but there is no provision for subsequent override by the General Assembly. One potential argument for this position is, it, in some cases, EPD acts as administrator of uh, programs that have been delegated to the state by the federal government. And an override by the General Assembly of a rule which is necessary to comply with federal requirements could jeopardize the state's authority to administer that federal program or it could jeopardize federal funding. That is not true in every case, but in many cases where it does involve federal programs, then you have that argument for not allowing legislative override. That's, that's the process in a nutshell. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> we'll let David say something, but I, stay nearby because you just I'd like to a add lot to of that, questions. That, okay. Yeah, that... Uh, our board takes very seriously any input from a Senate or a House member. Um, certainly, we understand that under the Board on Natural Resources that we operate only under the laws that you pass and only with the authority you give us. And our board would never want to take a position outside the laws or never would want to come confrontationally against uh, what the House or the Senate is saying in a law with a rule. Um, I know that 
Commissioner Holcomb has a lot of experience working on game and fish issues with those committees and coordinating with the committees and our board, and we do that on environmental too. I would say as individual members, if you ever through formal process or otherwise hear about a rule that we're proceeding that just doesn't sit right with you, let us know right away so we can work this out and resolve it before we have to get into what Mr. Allen talked about, about any kind of vetoing process. Unfortunately, although that's in the law, it's never had to been used. Actually, that was going to be my question. This seems, this is not, do other agencies, do other committees, are you, do you have any knowledge of this ever being done or used? In, in I have no state? knowledge of them being done in the Department of Natural Resources at all. Okay. Now, certainly there are times, there have been where the Department of Natural Resources is working on a rule and it comes to our attention maybe through uh, the Attorney General's office or other things that that rule we're working on is outside the scope of the law and we've gone back to the General Assembly to ask that the law be changed to accomplish the same result. But that's a matter of cooperation. Thank you. It, it seems to me that there, there is a very thorough process and an open process that, that you all have adopted through your rules and, and the public comment is um, very good and, and your interaction with the public is, is very important. So I just didn't know about this. So I, I've... I'm glad I got up so early this morning to come yeah. find this out. <laughs> we, we have some other questions, too. Number 10. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, State Senator Dan Weber, 40th District. And my question might be, I think, pretty closely related to what you've been talking about. I, could you explain in general, under the current legislative scheme, what is the scope of authority of the DNR, the DPD? How much discretion do you have? Uh, an example is this water use restriction was kind of a self-generated idea and that I assume is under some general grant of authority to make rules. And what are, what are the confines of that authority? Yes. Exactly. Um, the Environmental Protection Division, the Department of Natural Resources, the Board of Natural Resources, every executive office of government operates under the authorities and powers that the General Assembly gives us through law. So any rule that EPD would put to the board to implement must fall within the scope of that law. Sometimes the laws are very clearly defined. The Board of Natural Resources shall adopt a rule to do A, B, and C. The other times it's more generally defined. Part of the review process is, is on our rules to take a look at the statute and be sure that, it fall, that our rule falls within that statute, and that is part of the statement of rationale that we prepare as our public notice. We list in our public notice the statute that gives us the authority. If there's question, we go to the Department of Law, the Attorney General's office, office and ask them for an opinion of whether we fall within that statutory authority. So we have to stay within the law. That is our bounds. And it is something that is, if we're not diligent, it is sometimes easy to cross if we don't watch it very carefully. Thank you. Uh, I, I do not see any other questions, so now is your opportunity to af ask a question if you wish. Well, um, I have now. I knew I'd get a, All right. <laughs> Hold on just a second. I just, I, I, I would, and this, uh, Commissioner Holcomb, you may answer this. I don't know because it's, it's not just EPD issue, but I just, you were talking about earlier, y'all uh, allowing pets in in uh, cottages and things, cabins and all, in the parkways and all. Do you, did you like when you make a decision like that? Do you figure in a cost factor uh, of the uh, uh, the pets being staying in and some of them chewing up uh, furniture, chewing up uh, door jams? Uh, do, I mean, is that cost factor? figured in as to uh, what it's going to take and are you going to track that to see about the uh, charge of uh, extra charge to uh, have a pet? Yes, the short answer is certainly we do our due diligence. Uh, we're not charging more for the uh, pet, the particular cottages that would be pet friendly, but we do our due diligence to make sure we can recover costs through uh, the agreements when you take the cabin or uh, or the facility, whatever it may be, when uh, 
whatever rule may apply. So, yes, we do the due diligence uh, and look at those associated costs, be they direct or indirect, when we're looking at the rulemaking process. Thank you. I, I have one last question before we close here then. W would you give the website for, for people who are um, viewing this or for, for later review? Sure. I'm sure it's, we have it as, as legislators, but for the general public. It's uh, www.gaepd, and then click on Proposed Rules, and then you'll see a page that looks like this with all our rules listed and all the different dates and all the different information there. Also, if you want to be on our list, we have a list of people that we send our proposed rules to. We have a list of about 1,200 people. 85% of those we send emails to, which saves us a lot of money in postage. If you'd like to be on that list, you'll, you'll get an email from us every time we post a new rule that will have a link to that rule. And you can call us up at 1-888-373-5947, and the very nice woman answering the phone will put you on our list. For the rest of your life. Once you get on, we don't take you off. <laughs> this website is very powerful. I, 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 it's really good to, to use. Over, I, I find it very helpful. And then since I said there were no more questions, there are two more. So these will be our last two questions. And then for also for people who are watching this webcast, just so they understand, committee members are going to get up and have to leave. We, we meet. We have so many committee meetings during the legislative session, and, and sometimes... We just double time on, on when we have to meet. So that's why you see comings and goings of committee members. Well, let's go to number 15. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say, uh, David, I want to thank you for the years of professionalism and service that you've, you've given me over the past. You, you certainly uh, have the right to retire with a lot of pride. And, and thank you for what you've done for us in the state. Bob, thank you very much. That was a comment from former chair of this committee, Bob Hanner, from Parrot, Georgia. We also have um, number 23, and then uh, the chair of the Senate will make some final comments. Number 23. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I was just going to ask you about the website. Is that .org, .gov, .com, or? .org. It is. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, <coughs> Chairman Tollison. Uh, David, I just want to say from the Senate uh, how much we appreciate your service. Uh, I know you have a, uh, a job that uh, has a little contention in it every now and then, and uh, you've always been uh, very professional, and uh, your reputation is, uh, uh, will be around for a long time with someone that served with a lot of professionalism and, and treated everyone the same, and I think that's very important. We thank you for all your years of service. Thank you. Thank you, and um, in just a second we'll adjourn, but we want to thank Commissioner Holcomb. We want to thank Assistant Director Word, and uh, we also want to <coughs> thank Director Carol Couch because she's always here and available for us with our questions, and we certainly appreciate that. This is a very informative program, and thank you. So many of our committee members are new to this committee, and um, I, I will tell you as chair, I'm learning something every day. So we appreciate the interest in making sure we have the knowledge we need when it's time for us to make policy. We will probably have one last joint meeting this session because then we will start in our respective committees having to review all of the legislation that by that time will have made its way through the committee process. And um, we will announce that one for next week, but just plan on a joint committee next Thursday at 8.30. And, um, yeah. There is a resource, House Resource Subcommittee meeting this afternoon, room 213. No, 403. Well, I got that one wrong. 403. No, go to 213. No, it's 403 <laughs> at 230. There was, all right. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.